goodness, I can't. Most of the time, unless you work for me. Oh, God. That's all. Don't cross that one. Yeah. Check. Check, check. Also check, check. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's very echoey. Right. Gary, are we ready? Are you recording? All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's fine. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. So welcome, everyone. How's dinner? So we're really glad that you're here. And now we're kind of coming to the culmination of our evening events for Saturday. And we are pleasure to have a special guest here. And I'd like to introduce, and you're going to have to help me with this, Rosie. Schechter. Schechter. Yep. OK. Is the executive director of Amateur Radio Communications, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, from curriculum writing to project management to nonprofit leadership at organizations like Skull Crush, Stamen Design, Persco Persopic, Periscopic. Periscopic, and Burning Man, she has turned her love of learning to a lifelong practice. Rosie holds an MS in Digital Media from Georgia Institute of Technology and a BA in Philosophy and Creative Writing from Georgia State University. I'd like for you all to give a big round of applause to Rosie. Hello. Thanks, everyone. And can we also get another round of applause for Stephen and the entire Tapper team who have done such a great job? Thanks, y'all. It's not a small amount of work to do something like this, and they pulled it off seamlessly. So yeah, hi, my name is Rosie, and today we're going to uh, maybe take a little bit of a departure from some of the technical uh, topics that we've been talking about to uh, go through some on-ramps to learning technology and some other lessons from the road that I've learned, uh, many of which can be applied to amateur radio. Uh, so hello. This basically says what uh, Steve just said, so I'm not going to repeat it, except I'm going to add one thing that'll be important a little bit later, which is that I'm a map lover. I know that there are some folks in here who likes geospatial, right? Yep. OK, I'm one of them. And uh, yeah, so I've been on this like long and crazy career journey that's brought me to ARDC. And at ARDC, our mission is to support, promote, and enhance digital communication and broader communication science and technology. I will memorize this one day, but today is not the day. Uh, to promote amateur radio, scientific research, experimentation, education, development, open access, and innovation and information and communication technology. It's a mouthful. It's a very, very broad subject. But you know, as you can see, there's a big focus on amateur radio. And as I've heard mumblings this weekend from Tapper and others, and in many conversations throughout my time at Amateur Radio, time in Amateur Radio, we have this big question, which is how do we get more people, especially underrepresented groups like women, people of color, and young people involved in Amateur Radio? Um, and so today, what I'm hoping that we can look at is some examples from other technical fields that have addressed uh, similar questions. Uh, some of these are fields that I've worked in some qualities that these projects share, and then some ARDC grantees that em embody some of these qualities. So some good examples from our own um, community from how to sort of make this work happen. Uh, part of my talk comes from, uh, is inspired by my uh, former co-conspirator and dear friend, Lizzie Diamond, uh, who in 2015 at FOSS 4GNA, which is free and open source software for Geo North America in 2015, <clears throat> did this really wonderful talk on on-ramps to open source. So we're going to go through a few of her slides to sort of you know, set the stage. So there is a disconnect. It is difficult to join an open source community as a beginner. And it's difficult for an open source community to open itself up to beginners. Why? Open source is meant to be accessible by nature, and it is technically, but not always conceptually. 
1997, Eric Raymond published an essay called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Who here has read this essay? I had a feeling that a few of you have read this essay. So this is considered one of the seminal programming texts. It is an essay in praise of open source, particularly in the Linux community. The essay is full of quotes like this. A certain base level of design and coding skill is required, of course, but I expect almost anybody seriously thinking of launching a bizarre effort will already be above that minimum. The open source community's internal market and reputation exert subtle pressure on people not to launch development efforts they're not competent to follow through on. So far, this seems to have worked pretty well. So far, this seems to have worked pretty well. Side eye. Because, you know, it maybe works well for experienced programmers, but if you're somebody who's brand new, it can be really intimidating. There's a lot of jargon. I remember the first time I looked at GitHub and I was like, what is this? And someone was like, oh, just run a compiler and get it to run. And I was like, what? So yeah, there's a lot of room for bringing people in as beginners into open source. And I would say that that also applies to, to amateur radio. So what can be done to overcome both technical and conceptual barriers to entry to open source and related communities? So I'm gonna talk about some of the projects I've worked on. One of which is map time, um, which I did with my friend Lizzie. It was really fun. Um, map time started as me wanting to, I was surrounded by all these men who knew about geospatial and D3 and JavaScript. And I was like, you know what? I wanna get better at this. So I started a little meetup in, at my office in San Francisco. We brought people together. We um, just like started going through JavaScript tutorials, sort of plotting things along. There were four of us when it started. And by the end of it, we had 60 chapters all over the world, okay? Of people who were getting together to learn how to make open source maps. It was bizarre. I had never seen or been a part of anything that blew up like this before. And part of what we did, part of our approach was that you know, the space was really all about co-learning. We had some experts in the room and we had some novices and we really did our best to elevate everybody's knowledge within that space. Um, there was mentorship. Some of the people who are more experts helped to bring other people up to speed with certain subjects that might have been hard. There were no stupid questions. We really met people where they were at. You know, they could come over at the to the office after work, chill out, eat some snacks. I mean, people love the snacks. Um, and basically all were welcome. And what we, I was really fun was that, you know, experimentation was really encouraged. And by the way, this, we were only doing open source mapping. So that was very, very important to us. So experimentation was encouraged. Messing up was encouraged as an opportunity for learning. This was one of my favorite maps that somebody made. They were like trying to put like the names of all the countries on this map and do some weird like Voronoi colorful background and it's just so bizarre. This was supposed to be a map of San Francisco um, and somebody inverted some numbers by accident and added like an image where some roads were supposed to be. And how, I mean, how beautiful and weird and fun is that? Um, we also did activities, you know, because there were a lot of designers in the area who were really interested in mapping. Uh, we did this uh, activity multiple times called hand-drawn maps where we would literally print out a giant map make map tiles and then people would come and trace over it and make their own versions of maps. So it was really fun. And as Lizzie talks about in her talk and as I'll talk about here, there were what's great about maps and is that there are multiple on-ramps to learning about them. There's art and design, there's programming, there's data science, there's cartography, there's GIS, uh, geographic information systems, which is technically a little separate from cartography, I promise. You know, there's geo databases, there's so many things. And so depending on what someone's like seed of interest might be, you have this way to pull them into learning about maps. Um, the other thing that we did uh, is we really broke things down to basics, you know? Who here knows what a map tile is? Haha, <laughs> okay, this is a great opportunity right now. So um, map tiles are, when you look at a map, and this isn't true so much anymore because we've moved on to more advanced technology, but do you remember when you would load a Google map and it would like fill in like one little square at a time? Each one of those squares is a map tile. And the way that they used to be made is that you would have sort of a base map tile and then you would have layers on top of it that you could um, that you could uh, like 
program into uh, program into the actual base later. And then there was something called a UTF grid, which is something that was like a little tiny bit of programming so that like if you hovered over a certain portion of the map, you'd maybe get like a little bubble or something. And then all of these were smushed down into a single raster, right? And then you could put different mapping data on top of it. So, you know, we would really break things down into like their most simplistic and basic forms so that people could really get it. And when I say people, I mean people like me. I love technology and technology is not something that has come easy. I have fought and clawed to learn everything that I know. And I've had really great mentors over the years who have helped me out. So part of what I want to do is help other people with that kind of stuff. So yeah, the results, we had 60 chapters all over the world at our height uh, before all of us got burnt out. So that was great. Um, the Tapper organizers and anyone who's run an open source community knows about that very particular type of burnout. Uh, we'll have to talk on that. Another project or another, uh, this was actually a, like a job job. Another organization that I worked for is uh, an organization called Skill Crush. Uh, people often call it Skull Crush. Skill Crush is the actual name. And what Skill Crush is, is a women focused technology learning platform. Um, as we all know, there's a lot of underrepresentation of women and oop, a lot, uh, there's underrepresentation of women in technology. What Skill Crush does is it makes really affordable classes. Um, it meets people where they're at. It lets people learn at their own pace. Part of what I did for this job was curriculum development. By the way, I've talked to a number of you who do curriculum development and training development. It's so fun. So um, Skill Crush has great curriculum, really breaks it down to basics. I can't show you any examples because it is proprietary. Um, but they also offer like job seeking support, low cost, break it down to basics, really great. Um, and then again, there's multiple on ramps to learning. There's these days, there's a visual design course, there's the UI and UX course, front end coding, and then some Python. And the result is that thousands of women who have gone through this program now have jobs in technology, and it costs them a few hundred dollars, about a hundred hours in class, and probably an internship, which the folks at Skill Crush would help to set up for them. So of these two projects, which I've had the great privilege of working on, what are some of the key ingredients? One is that the cost is either free or low. Um, you know, doing a free model did lead to some burnout. You know, the low, there's a low cost of Skill Crush with a free coding camp, which in capitalism makes it a little bit more sustainable. Um, they're both beginner focused. They both have a welcoming environment. They both meet people where they're at. They both have peer mentorship, which is really huge. Um, opportunities for hands-on learning and then multiple, multiple ways in. Um, something that Skill Crush had that last time didn't is that they had financial support through, um, through a scholarship program. They also gave folks support for next steps like finding that internship or that job. And really importantly, they're underrepresented group focused. You know, I started MapTime because, well, I started MapTime because I wanted to learn and because I wanted other women to learn. And about two years in, I remember I was doing a mapathon and serving cake to a sea full of like 60 men. And I was like, you know what? I don't know if this is exactly what I meant to do. And it was still really cool, but it was like, just, it was just not exactly what I was going for. And we did, we did help a few women get uh, jobs in mapping, which was great. Um, and one thing that map time has that Skill Crush doesn't is a really is an open source focus. Um, and I get why Skill Crush is in that way. Again, they're a company, but the open source tools made it really easy and accessible for people to be able to learn without having to, you know, put a bunch of money into something. You know, if you want to get an Esri license, I can't remember which Esri is a large uh, geospatial mapping platform. You know, a license for those could be hundreds, if not a few thousand dollars, if I remember correctly. So using open source tools really lowered the barrier to entry. So a couple additional notes from the IEEE who just put out this uh, audiobook, Free to Choose STEM. You know, if you want to get women into STEM in particular, you want to have girls only spaces for middle and high school students. Uh, you want to have a growth versus a fixed mindset, you know, saying that like you want, you know, you want your students to not say, oh, I'm bad at math. I could never do that. You want to get rid of like, oh, you're not a real ham, right? Some of this kind of language can, you know, really shut people down and keep people in the out group. Whereas like if you're having a, you know, a growth mindset about your students and about the subject matter, it can really help you, you know, to be encouraged to learn. 
And then last but not least is in addressing imposter syndrome. You know, when you don't see people who are like you doing the work that you want to do, or if you've been told that like you're not good at something, you might feel like you're not good enough. And there's so much perfectionism that women in particular have to face growing up and in our conditioning that we never feel like we're good enough. So addressing imposter syndrome as part of curriculum is really important, and the IEEE uh, points that out. So, you know, in amateur radio, we have all of these on-ramps. It's really cool. There's radio astronomy, there's electrical engineering, there's emergency services and communications, there's off-grid living, which by the way, that's my on-ramp. I'm super, super into that. Um, there's citizen band and shortwave listening, there's IT and networking, there's just open source in general, which I feel like there's a nice Venn diagram overlap. And then, of course, there's hacking and makerspaces, which, you know, I think is a whole community of people that we could, um, you know, that we could really tap into. Someone was just telling me about how they were setting up a, a like a little tiny ham radio set up at a local makerspace, and we're really excited to teach people about stuff there. Okay. So, I'm happy to say it's great to see some ARDC grantees putting some of these ideas into place, and I didn't even have to say anything. They just do it all on their own. Um, one of these grantees is the MORE project, uh, the Make Operating Radio Easier project. It's an initiative to reduce both gender and age imbalances in amateur radio through education and hands-on activities, run by Dr. Rebecca Mercur Mercury, known as Dr. M. And, you know, through this program, she is not only putting together curriculum, she has been supporting people, uh, with making sure that their license exams are covered. She's helping the teachers also get a little bit of a stipend. Um, and so, you know, her project basically checks all of these boxes. Um, I don't know if she's using open source technology, but she is uh, making an open access paper. And I wasn't sure about the support for Next Step, so I just didn't check it. Um, and the result is, you know, she's got multiple training locations in progress. And as of way earlier this year, she had her first students uh, pass the training with 20 in the queue. Another great project that we funded is Outreachy. And Outreachy provides internships in open source and open science, uh, primarily to people who have been subject to systemic bias and impacted by under underrepresentation in the technical industry where they are living. Um, so what Outreachy does, and I'm so proud that we have been supporting it, uh, they offer $7,000 uh, for each internship stipend. And for those of you who have grueled your way for, through an unpaid internship, you know how important that can be. Uh, the work is remote, and so, you know, anybody who's in part of the program can work on the, can be part of it from wherever they are. And they, you know, it's about three months. So they run May, May to August or December through March. And, you know, this is a project that checks all of the boxes. Um, Outreachy, which is sponsored by the uh, Software Freedom Conservancy, helps their participants with all of these pieces, um, including support for next steps, which is, you know, finding a job in open source. So, you know, in 2021, for example, out of over 2,600 applications, uh, we had 61 paid internships, um, and they, the subjects that the people were involved with included things like open science, open humanitarian work, as well as open source development in general, which is really, really huge. Did I just cut out? Okay. The, the, the next group I want to talk about is the Society of Women Engineers, uh, which has been a great organization to work with. Um, ARDC has helped them with over 30 scholarships for their electrical engineering degrees uh, for women, half of, which to half of which went to people of color. Um, plus, there is a, a high school leadership academy, which targets high school age girls. It does seem like for amateur radio, like middle to high school does seem to be a key target for getting them involved in, in amateur radio as well as other STEM activities. And then there is a collegiate uh, leadership institute, um, which includes this research around underrepresentation of women in color and engineering which includes some, uh, uh, some participants from historically black colleges and universities as well as, I can't remember what HSI stands for, do you remember? But it's for Hispanic specific uh, institutions. So again, checks all the boxes. I put a question mark with hands-on learning because college can be kind of, you know, 
theoretical at times, but you know, you're definitely getting, you know, you're getting a lot of learning in college and you know, they really support open research. Any grant that we give at ARDC has to have some kind of open access or um, <clears throat> more open source component. So every one of these uh, organizations check those boxes. And the grantees who do this work don't end here. I had to really hold myself back from being like, and this one, and this one, and this one. I mean, we've given, we're close to have given over two, like nearly 200 grants, or we'll be at 200 grants by the end of the year. So, but just to call out a couple of folks, um, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, um, there we've just funded a project that is really doing beginning instruction for LGBTQIA and uh, BIPOC students uh, get to get their technician and general licenses including intro to radio technologies, as well as a scalable curriculum. By the way, I hear a lot about people doing scalable curriculums. I want to put you all together so we can make one big curriculum. Um, and then hands-on activities that will deepen their subject knowledge and, you know, ideally get these folks into careers in astronomy and space, which is amazing. And then there is the Bridgerland Amateur Radio Club, which has done a great job of introducing youth to amateur radio and engaging them in activities themed around space, science, and technology. I mean, it's interesting that space has come up a couple of times, right? I feel like space subjects, I mean, that is the future. And so there's a lot of opportunity for imagination and exploration uh, with space-based subjects. So right, so they've put together a portable ground station. They've had instruction for making ISS contacts. They've done hands-on satellite making workshops for youth ages 11 to 17. And they do educational events about how to find, track, and communicate through amateur satellites. So, you know, I love this, that there are some young kids who are learning how to solder. It's awesome. So, you know, as my friend Lizzie would probably say, if you want more people in amateur radio, here's what to do. Let's identify some comfortable introductions to not geospatial open source, but amateur radio and digital communications. Thank you. Come over here to the safe zone. Yeah. Okay. Check, check. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Do you have time for a few questions? Sure. Okay, how about some questions? Oh, come on. I paid a couple of you. Not enough. <laughs> Obviously not enough. Okay, yes, Bill? I guess you'll have to come up here. Yeah, I've thought a lot about how to get girls more interested mm -hmm. in STEM. Uh-oh. Is the microphone not working? I can, well, I can, I can eat the mic. If the, you yeah. want me to eat the mic? Yeah. I've thought a lot about how to get girls more interested in STEM mm -hmm. stuff. You know. And there seems to be this societal or cultural thing that kind of works against us, um, that makes... I, I think they pick it up from TV and, and movies and stuff that... Uh, things that, valuing things that are very superficial, mm -hmm. like, and girls tend to become interested in because it's, they, they're, they absorb it all day long, every day. They think the very superficial things are very important, how I look, so, and how things look. And so they become interested in cosmetology and fashion design and a whole bunch of things that are, I don't want to say they're bad, but it doesn't lead them into these deep areas that we want them to get into to become doctors and engineers. And I mean, how do we overcome the societal bias towards making girls lean towards very superficial things that are really at cross purposes to what we're talking about here? The, 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 the um, what would you say that the pressures that come from society are are very strong? I mean, I don't know how you overcome that. I mean, I have four granddaughters, and I don't want them to all think that 
how their nails look is the most important thing. No, I want them to go into medicine. I, I don't know how to do that. Well, the first step is to take down all the corporations, <laughs> which I will do single-handedly after this meal. No, I mean, there's no, it's such a great question and there's not a great answer. I mean, it's gonna take a million tiny little actions on all of our parts. There's a psychological component that has to do with you know, when, gr when little girls are little, don't tell them about, about how pretty they are. Tell them about how clever they are. Tell them about how, what a great job they did on a project at school and encourage them to be in a place of learning rather than focusing on their looks. This happens to girls, like, from basically birth, you know? I even have had, you know, comments from colleagues who were like, I remember one person said to me, well, before, we'd only talked on the phone, and he said, well, I knew you were smart. I didn't realize you were so pretty. And it's like, I'm a 35-year-old woman and you are a 60-year-old man. Like, we don't need to be talking about how I look. So there's psychological components. There's also putting things in front of kids to make them learn. Um, I heard, uh, and I see you, I'll come to you in just a second. There is a woman I was listening to on NPR who is, I can't remember her name, but she's a correspondent on CNN and she, I think her mom was from Nigeria and then they grew up in near Oxford in the UK. And she really wanted to go to Oxford. Her mom wanted to go to Oxford, her to go to Oxford, but she didn't really have the grades. And so her mom did this thing where she was like, okay, here's the deal. No TV until you get an acceptance letter from Oxford. And she was like, okay. And for two or three years, she studied with her friends and you know, didn't watch any TV until she got that acceptance letter from Oxford, which of course changed her life and it changed the life of her family. So there is a piece of it that's also, I think, about discipline and about parenting. Um, I don't want to say take away things like television or comic books or magazines, because then that just makes people rebel even more. But, you know, there's a lot of work that parents can do to sort of shepherd their kids in the right direction. Educate yeah, educate the parents. Dang skippy. You know, I think uh, this is one of those topics where we're all in what we like to call violent agreement. But, uh, you know, Bill, I don't want to let it pass unnoticed the uh, implication that things that are considered feminine are automatically superficial. I think that if you begin a conversation with somebody that you want to welcome into a space by critiquing something about them that is unrelated to the space that you want to welcome them into, then that is going to generate a disadvantage. Admittedly, I have not done my nails. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hard subject. Oh. Hi. Hi. Pat, N-A-P-K. No disrespect, Rosie, but I had an answer for you. The thing is, though, it hit me on more than one slide there. The one thing that could override some of these societal uh, distractions, uh, the M word, mentorship. Mm -hmm. When you get one on one or one on a few, mm -hmm. and they discover, and their eyes light up, these moment of discoveries through mentorships, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a, a capital investment right there. Yeah, I think that that's true. I agree with that. I um, vaguely remember an episode of Big Bang Theory. I don't remember the details, but, but they were asking our scientists in the Big Bang Theory to talk to some high school girls to get them interested in science. And at some point they said, we're going too late. High school's too late. Hmm. We need to go to elementary school, junior high school. Mm -hmm. By high school, they may not be set, but we're not going to get their early interest. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it always struck me as something to think about at least. Oh, for sure. I think, I, you know, I have seen, this is actually my nephew and not my niece, um, I think that there's some truth to what you're saying. I think the earlier that you can get kids interested in the sciences, the better off that they're going to be and the greater their chances are of going in that direction once 
once the hormones kick in and there's no coming back. Um, but at the same time, you know, I have seen, you know, my nephew was kind of a hellion growing up basically. And, you know, never wanted to follow rules, never wanted to do dishes, never wanted to do anything. And then suddenly he saw his sister get into an, into St. Andrews in Scotland. And suddenly he was like, oh wait, maybe I also would like to go to math class now, you know? And suddenly he like got his butt in gear. And so I think there's, a, you know, speaking of mentorship, it's also about having really great role models and people that you admire. And those people can come into your life at any time. My nephew is now 16 and making the shift. So it is, it is possible. But I hear you, yeah. I think an, another example, if, how many of you here mentor students in robotics? There's a few hands. First Robotics. So Dean Kamen, of course, creates FIRST, and it's an acronym, and it stands for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. That's what FIRST stands for. And he saw where there was more hero worship toward actors, musicians, lawyers, not to, not to really, okay, I have lawyers that are friends, okay. Lawyers are great. Yeah, oh. And he wanted to create this positive atmosphere and, and this is a lot of what Rosie's talking about here is you've got to create a positive atmosphere for these kids regardless of their age, mm -hmm. right? So don't think they're too far gone. Mm -hmm. If you create the right environment for them, get them engaged in something that interests them, not what interests you. Yeah. Okay. And latch on to that. Right. And that's, I think, part of the on ramps concept that's so important Absolutely. is that it's like, what is their little hook? You know? Absolutely. And yeah. you have to find that. So it's up to you to find that. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a tagline which I have used quite successfully on several occasions with young girls, teenagers, even in junior high school. And this is something all of you can remember. <clears throat> you get engaged to them, you know, and says, look, how old are you, you know, 13, 14? Yeah, okay. Can you own a car? No. Can you own a gun? No. Uh, can you have your own credit card? No. And do you know a bunch of boys in your school that are dead from the neck up? Yes. How'd you like to be something that no one else in your school has? A real full strength federal license with an identifier that by international treaty is good anywhere in the world. And when you walk into the club meeting, they don't tell you, oh, hi, little girl, now go sit in the corner. It's, oh, hi, welcome, sister. That is an icebreaker which will get their attention. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to follow through, but it will get, it'll break the ice, and you're speaking their language. You're not talking to them as an adult. You're talking to them in a way they will understand and relate to because everything I just said, can you do this? No. Do you know boys that are dead from the neck up? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And all these other things, that's first person. That's real to them. And then when you hit them with, by the way, you can do this, it's like, oh, wow. The light goes on. Try it. Worth a shot. Okay, I think, did we get the point across? Thanks, everybody. All right, big round of applause.